The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you a picture of Thomas Jefferson as a great leader in American education. At the close of our broadcast, in place of our regular story of chemistry, we shall have the privilege of presenting Mr. Pierre S. DuPont, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the DuPont Company. It is particularly appropriate that we have Mr. DuPont with us on this program, since his great-great-grandfather, Pierre Samuel DuPont de Nemours, had much to do with Thomas Jefferson's plans for free education, and indeed appears as a character in tonight's story. In 1802, Jefferson himself encouraged the elder DuPont's son, E.I. DuPont, to found the company which, after 136 years, still bears his name. From this beginning grew the ideals of chemical research responsible today for so many better things for better living. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play Virginia from the musical comedy of the same name, which has been dedicated to the University of Virginia. Cavalcade moves forward. Born April thirteenth, seventeen hundred and forty three. 195 years ago today, at Shadwell in Albemarle County, Virginia, the son of Peter Jefferson and Jane Randolph, Thomas Jefferson's aristocratic environment seemed only to intensify his democratic ideals. In the year 1760, three years after his father's death, he entered William and Mary College situated in Williamsburg, then the capital of the Royal Colony of Virginia. Some months later, Chancellor George Wythe the ablest lawyer in the colony, calls on Governor Francis Fouquier in the handsome mansion known as the Governor's Palace. Your Excellency, Chancellor Wynne. Welcome, Chancellor. Thank you, sir. 
Did I hear you playing as I came along the passageway? Yes. This is the new harpsichord. Oh. I had it sent me from Vienna with a packet of the latest tunes by a young composer named Joseph Haydn. I wanted you and Dr. Small to hear them. Uh, didn't the doctor come with you? Uh, he said he'd meet me here. He stopped to fetch a new student of his, a young man of whom he thinks highly. A student, eh? I had no idea Dr. Small thought our discussion so elementary. <laughs> he says the youngster has uncommon brains. Oh? And he's heir to one of the largest plantations in the West. And, uh, in addition, he plays the violin. I would be interested to meet this prodigy. Your Excellency. Yes, Jasper. Dr. Small. Oh, come in, Doctor. I'm very glad to see you. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good evening, Chancellor. Good evening, Doctor. With your permission, I'd like to present a new pupil, a friend of mine, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. As Chancellor Witt, you have met. You are most welcome, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you, sir. It's an honor I appreciate. Then you don't share the feelings of many of the planters in your section of the colony. Most of them don't feel honored to meet the royal governor. I meant I was honored to meet the man, sir, not the office. You have an analytical mind, I see. Well, I'm afraid I'm to blame for that. I teach him both mathematics and philosophy, and he seems to combine the most prominent features of each. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's destined for the law. Someday I hope to persuade you to receive him as your pupil, Chancellor. Your recommendations bear great weight, Doctor. I, I hope you like William and Mary, Mr. Jefferson. Very much indeed, Chancellor. I never thought I'd see such a beautiful city. But it seems a shame that Virginians must travel to Williamsburg to get an education or else do without. They're fortunate to receive one even here. <laughs> what would you have us do, Mr. Jefferson? Move the college closer to your home? No, I didn't mean to move William and Mary anywhere. That's needed here. But I believe we need colleges in every district in the colony. Grammar schools for everyone. What, Mr. Jefferson? Would you educate the common people? Yes, sir, everyone. The farmer and the craftsman have as much right to an education as we have, and the more our people know, the better off our country will be. Why, that idea is almost revolutionary. I warned you this fledgling could fly, sir. He'll have a long flight before our rich planters pay to educate the populace. Once the schools were built, perhaps the people would pay to educate themselves. Even if they would, your planters would not permit it. Nor would I. Then, sir, it will be done in spite of them. I beg your pardon, sir. Well... Mr. Jefferson, every man has a right to an education. It's a shameful thing that there should be as many human beings in the colony who cannot even read or write. Would you make a gentleman of everyone, Mr. Jefferson? If a gentleman is superior only because he keeps others in ignorance, there's no honor in his position. Men are born free and equal. They have an equal right to grow in mind as well as body, and no one has the right to keep them from it. <coughs> yes, well, yes, uh, yes. <coughs> Sorry, sir. I had meant to be so forward. Well, we'll say no more of it. I uh, understand you play the violin, Mr. Jefferson. Yes, sir. I explained our musical evenings, Your Excellency, and uh, asked Mr. Jefferson to bring his violin with him. Oh, yes, I see you have it with you. I have here some of the latest tunes of Joseph Haydn. Perhaps you would like to try one with me? I should be glad to, sir. I hope, Dr. Small, that your protege is not as radical about his music as he is in his ideas on education. I hope to be able to follow you there, sir. Well, I'm afraid you and Dr. Small have a hard time ahead teaching our Mr. Jefferson some of his lessons. Oh, well, we can but teach him theories. He'll have to learn the practical side from his own neighbors. My neighbors are not all planters, sir. My nearest neighbors are my workers. <laughs> He's a lawyer already with. Here, let's see about the music. Are you ready, Mr. Jefferson? Whenever you are, sir. One, two... One, two. of his independence and fiery disposition, the red-headed young student became a frequent and welcome visitor at the governor's palace. And in his memoirs, written many years later, he credits much of his instruction to what he calls his four-cornered meetings with Dr. Small, Governor Fouquier, and Chancellor Wythe. 
He finished his studies at William and Mary in two years, and through Dr. Small's influence, took up the study of law with the chancellor. In 1767, he was admitted to the bar, and his success was immediate. In 1769, he was elected to the House of Burgesses. In February, a year later, we find him leaving one of the sessions with George Wythe, who is also a member. Tom, I'm certainly proud of you and your keen interest and your knowledge of the law. Well, I am interested in the law, Mr. Wythe, but I wish I knew better what the law really is. You must know the law. You wouldn't be allowed to practice. What I mean is I've seen copies of many of the old laws. They're obscure in both meaning and printing some of the older laws have but one faded copy in existence. Why? How do you know all this? I've been collecting them. Some copies are unique. Many conflict. Do you mean to get ahead of us all by owning copies of all the laws? No, sir. I mean to make them public property. I want to codify them, publish them. Hmm. You'd make a code of the whole law of the colony? Yes, sir, and I'd begin a systematic effort to repeal those that are no longer practical or useful. But publishing such a code would cost a good deal. I ask no financial recompense, only one reward. The addition of one law that I would draw up myself. What would be the objective of such a law? To establish religious freedom in Virginia. A praiseworthy ambition. But one, I'm afraid, which will find little favor. Oh, there's someone looking for you. Well, that's one of the men from my plantation. Here, boy. Master, I've ridden all night to bring you this letter. What's the matter? Is anyone ill? Your home is Chadwell, Master Jefferson. It burned to the ground. Burned to the ground? Was anyone hurt? No, Master Jefferson. But we didn't save stick nor stone. My books? All gone, Master. Except we did save your fiddle. Save my fiddle, but not my books. I'm sorry, Tom. That's bad news indeed. Your home destroyed. Yes, my books I feel worst about. Well, I'll have to start collecting again. Jefferson started a new home on the top of the hillside at Monticello, and that and his political interests occupied most of his time. The bill for religious freedom did not pass until 1786, ten years after he had written the most famous of all American documents, the Declaration of Independence. These were two of the three achievements in which Jefferson had the greatest pride. The third took longer to accomplish than the others. In the year 1800, when Jefferson was vice president of the United States, he sent an invitation to an old friend, a former official of the Department of Commerce in the government of France, an educator and administrator of experience and reputation, Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours. Dupont arrives in Philadelphia, where he finds Jefferson in conversation with a man whom we will call Mr. Woody. Monsieur Jefferson, it is a great pleasure to meet you once again. My dear Monsieur Dupont, you've come just in the nick of time. I've been having an argument with my fellow Virginian here. Now, Woody, we have you outnumbered. Oh, uh, Mr. Woody, this is Monsieur Dupont, a gentleman who was very cordial to me when I was in France. I'm very glad to know you, sir. Monsieur? Take this chair by the fire. Monsieur Dupont? Merci bien, monsieur. Uh, Mr. Woody owned one of the finest plantations in Virginia. Not much larger than your own, Jefferson. But more productive of everything but education. Whose education we were discussing, Monsieur Dupont. Oh, an interesting subject, Monsieur. I claim that my family and I are as well educated as any in Virginia, Mr. Jefferson. I only wish you could say that all people in Virginia were as well educated as you, sir. What would the people do with education? It would make them dissatisfied. I think it would make them better and more useful citizens. It would interfere with their work. It would make them work more intelligently, make them constructive thinkers. 
Monsieur Dupont, can't you help me reason with this Virginia Pharisee here? <laughs> I am afraid, Mrs. Jefferson, that no man can reason except with his own thoughts. There is a debt of service due from every man to his country proportionate to the bounties which nature and fortune have meted out to him. The United States are more advanced in their educational facilities than most countries. Children are encouraged to read and comment. Controversy has developed argumentation and given room for the exercise of logic. This country has a large proportion of moderately well-informed men. But uh, that does not mean that the general education cannot be improved. And if improvement is a possibility, it is a duty. Monsieur Dupont, you are highly informed. I wonder if you would favor me by writing down your plans for a perfect university. I would very much appreciate your advice before I take up my idea with the legislature. I would be very glad to do all that I can to help, sir. It will get you nowhere, Jefferson. Because I warn you that I'll fight you through the state in every election on the floor of the legislature itself. Before I'll pay one penny to educate any children but my own. Then let me tell you, Woody, that a system of general instruction which shall reach every description of our citizens, from the richest to the poorest, has always been my ideal. First ideal. First ideal. First ideal. First, last, and always concerned. Pierre Samuel Dupont, at the request of Thomas Jefferson, prepared a treatise on national education in the United States of America which was to influence Jefferson in his continued efforts to establish an educational system. After Jefferson became president, he tried to get a national university provided for by an amendment to the Constitution. Failing this, he concentrated all his efforts in fathering the first state university. After his retirement from office, he became trustee of Albemarle Academy, which became Central College. And finally, in January 1819, his charter was changed to that of the University of Virginia. On the board with Jefferson were ex-president James Madison and President James Monroe. Jefferson was unanimously appointed the university's first head or rector. One unfortunate occurrence marred the beginnings of the new university. But Jefferson managed matters in his customary, straightforward way. In the rector's study... Jefferson talks with Thomas Cooper, professor of chemistry. Dr. Cooper, I'm in a dilemma that only you can help me solve. Anything in my power, Mr. Jefferson? I appointed you to the chair of chemistry because of one thing. I believed and still believe <clears throat> that you are the most suitable man for that position in the country. Thank you, sir. Not only your friendship with Priestley, but your own profound education and capacity made me feel that my judgment was correct. Is anything wrong with me or my work, sir? What I have to say is difficult for a man who worked for years to pass the bill for religious freedom in the state of Virginia. Unfortunately, certain... People of our state have raised a hue and cry, Dr. Cooper. You mean because I do not entirely conform to their religious beliefs? Yes. And as this is a state university supported by state funds, they feel they have a right to make certain demands. Mr. Jefferson, I thank you for being frank. I've enjoyed working for you and with you. I realize my beliefs are frowned on by most of our citizens. But I would be the last man to stand in the way of education. Will you accept my resignation? With regret, Dr. Cooper. If I did not ask this very difficult favor of you, it's possible that we could not continue the support of the state. If they ask it of me, I shall also resign. For education itself is more important than any individual.
Anderson's resignation was never demanded. His plans for the University of Virginia were carried out, and it stands today as a monument to his genius. In the year 1825, Thomas Jefferson, now advanced in years, is waiting on the classic campus of his beloved university as a young man approaches him. Well, I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, could you direct me to the administration office? Uh, I'm going there myself. I'll be glad to show you the way. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, I can hardly believe the new university is really opening today. We've wanted it so long, and, well, I've been watching its buildings going up. And... Are you going to follow a course of studies here? Yes, sir. I hope it won't be a waste of your father's money, young man. Well, my father has nothing to do with it, sir, so he is willing to spare me from the forge. He's a blacksmith, sir. You have a scholarship, then, from the state? Well, you might put it that way, sir, but to my way of thinking, the scholarship comes more from the doings of Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson? Oh, nonsense. He's just a pedant, an old busybody with a lot of crazy ideas. Lots of people say so. No one with any sense would say so. Yeah. You know him, then? No, not in person. Only his works, but no good American could speak such ill of him. This is a free country. Neither you nor anyone has the right to make free with another man's good name. He's done you no harm, sir, and me much good. Have you no respect for my gray hairs, young man? Well, not if they brought you to no more wisdom than this. Well spoken, sir. What? The university will be fortunate to have such brave young thinkers as you. Well, well, you change about quickly, sir. Yes. Now, you must... Excuse me now, young man. Here come two of my friends. They've been waiting for me. What? Well, one of them is President Monroe. Yes. And the short man nearest us is a member of the board. Ah, hello, Madison. Have I kept you waiting? No, Jefferson. Monroe and I knew you'd want to be alone here for a while today, looking over your handiwork. Mr. Jefferson? You're Mr. Thomas Jefferson? Oh, oh forgive me, sir. For what? Oh, I was bad man of the way I spoke to you. I... Well, then, you see, I'm not a gentleman, and I reckon I never will be. You are a gentleman in the best and broadest sense. And here at our university, we want freedom of thought, or none at all. Well, sir, I, I only meant to defend the truth as I thought it. That does you honor, sir. Madison, I'll give the university a motto, inspired by my new friendship with this young man here. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. You should be very proud of your university, Jefferson. I am proud and grateful. Grateful that I've lived to see its completion. July 4th, 1826, his great work done, Jefferson died and was buried under a tree at his beloved Monticello. On the stone that marked his last resting place was carved the epitaph he wrote for himself. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. For these three great achievements, for his service to his country and for his faith in men, DuPont salutes the memory of Thomas Jefferson, one of the foremost leaders in the cavalcade of America. We present at this time Mr. Pierre S. DuPont, great-great-grandson of Pierre Samuel DuPont de Nemours, and chairman of the board of directors of the DuPont Company, founded 136 years ago by the original Pierre DuPont's son, Eleuther Irénée. 
Twenty years ago, Mr. DuPont decided that the public school system in Delaware could and should be made a model for other states to follow. Since then, he has served as guiding hand on the State Board of Education and has helped build out of his own personal funds 120 public school and university buildings. During that time, Delaware's ranking in education has moved up from 36 to 6th place among the states. Mr. DuPont, uh, how does your great-great-grandfather's plan for public education strike you in the light of present-day development and your own experience? To answer that, I'll have to start right off by taking issue with my respected ancestor. He thought of education in terms of one great national system, controlled by a central government, because in France there were no state divisions, and France knew nothing of the advantages to accrue from competition between states. It is fortunate that we did not follow that part of DuPont's advice. Much of the progress we have made in education since that time is due to that fact, as Jefferson planned. Our school systems have remained local affairs, supported and supervised by people of the localities they serve, and organized to meet local conditions. And with each state having its own educational system, the competition has kept them on their toes in the struggle to make progress. Well, regarding your own work in public education, Mr. DuPont, where did you find the greatest need for improvement? Twenty years ago, we in Delaware thought the first step toward better education was to select good teachers, to arrange a better course of studies, and to compel attendance. But we put the cart before the horse. We now know that the first requirements are modern buildings, not of the little red schoolhouse type, but buildings fitted for general education and for vocational training, recreation, and the like. Large, well-designed buildings with present uh, surroundings and facilities to make school interesting not only attract better teachers, but are more powerful in enforcing attendance than any attendance officer. In Delaware, public school attendance has more than doubled in the last 20 years. And whereas most of our boys and girls used to quit school between the 6th and 8th grade, the average now go through at least two years of high school. Well, then you feel, Mr. DuPont, that in addition to general cultural courses, students should be given vocational guidance. Training along practical lines brings out a student's natural abilities and equips him to earn a better living. The young people who studied some trade or vocation in school have made much better records in getting and holding jobs. Uh, what is the DuPont Company doing to encourage young people to take advanced training to fit them for better jobs in industry? One of the most interesting to me is the DuPont Fellowship Plan, established 20 years ago. This plan assists the unusually promising graduate students to continue their studies and research in chemistry and chemical engineering. The universities themselves select the students who are deemed worthy of the fellowships and also name research subjects. Last year, postgraduate and postdoctorate fellowships were awarded to 24 advanced students in 18 universities. Since the plan went into effect, more than 360 awards have been made. Well, Mr. DuPont, what in your opinion does all this effort to provide an education for everybody really mean to America? It means that our ability to appreciate, to desire, to produce, and to use the finer things in life is steadily increasing. The people of the United States enjoy more comforts and conveniences than any people ever did before. And with education working hand in hand with science and industry, no man can foretell the standard of living that the future promises for America. Well, thank you, Mr. DuPont. I'm sure that note of confidence in this country carries on the tradition set by your ancestor, Pierre Samuel DuPont de Namur, and his illustrious friend, Thomas Jefferson. A story of the 4-H Club the great farm youth organization of today will be the subject of our broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. Thank you.